we're working with five community organizations that have been doing community food system work, supporting their work, and essentially doing what I call rigorous storytelling with them about what they do. I love the phrase food dignity. I love that as the title of this project it, because it's instantly compelling. You hear that and you just sit back and think. The first time I heard it, you sort of sit back and think, of course. Like, who could not, who could not want that? Food justice, um, a way to, to support communities that are lacking um, grocery stores, um, affordable food, and providing knowledge on eating healthy. Not everyone is as aware of, of where, where their food comes from, and I feel like if not everyone feels empowered to make those choices, uh, make the healthier choices, and also not realizing that the history behind it. It's not that everyone just wanted a bodega on the corner. It's, it's systematic how, how they ended up that way. So just I just want people to know the history of their neighborhoods. My work and my focus in, in my life's work has not been food prior to this so much. But what I have found, and I think what partly drew me in, is that we do all need to eat. New York Farms has always tried to be a place where like people with great ideas and energy can come to grow those ideas um, and get some support from you know our staff or from other people in the community who have some knowledge or time um, to commit to, to those projects. Feeding Laramie Valley grows and gets donations of fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, which we uh, share with people in our community, in our whole county, really. And we encourage people to grow their own uh, and share those as well. And what Food Dignity has uh, helped us to get a sense uh, that we are connected with other communities all over the country um, and also given us ideas of how to do it in different ways and maybe even better ways uh, than we were doing it before. Now that academia has taken an interest in community food systems and food system approaches, uh, it became all the more important not to pass over, to ignore, um, but to instead center the voices that tell about the experience and the expertise about how to do, how to transform their food systems, to transform their communities, what it's like, from what it's like to be food insecure, uh, to how to end it. Um, and so I thought, I know that those first person stories have a lot of wisdom and answers for us that will, uh, that should be amplified. Finding the moment. Um, I think you know that one is really meant to get to the idea that we only have about two or three minutes to create in a space of about two or three minutes for these stories, and so obviously you can't kind of tell your whole life story, and so it can be really useful to zero in on a specific scene or moment that can kind of help illustrate your the, the inside of your story. Today is the anniversary of my um, elder brother passing, and he was obese, and then he developed pancreatitis, developed pancreatic cancer, you know, and he died all within like a year of the diagnosis. So telling this story, it, it has allowed me to, um, one, honor um, my brother um, because it, he is really just another statistic to a lot of people. That's what he would be. Um, but he was so much more. And in the course of my work and in telling the story, 
Um, I just feel like I'm having an opportunity to honor his life and to really make a statement about um, just sort of narrowing things down to say that it's a matter of choice. Because if you don't have the knowledge or you don't have the resources, it doesn't matter how much choice you want to make, yeah, you can't make that choice. Um, I had I'd grown up, well, one summer my nephew wanted pickles, so I was growing cucumbers and they never got to any length to make pickles for him because they ate them up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> my grandkids, they were, I asked them what, where carrots came from, they said, oh, you go to the grocery store and buy them all the, <laughs> the plastic, I know you don't. So when they figured out where carrots came from, the carrots never got full maturity. <laughs> the joy that you brought to telling us about your grandkids eating the, the food that you grew it was just like so precious. Like it was so amazing to see everybody's face light up too when you said like they just ripped them out of the ground before they got mature enough. <laughs> Growing up, I didn't. We didn't eat beef. We didn't. We like all the all the meat we ate for the most part was was game meat mm -hmm. and. I mean, that's how I have continued to, to eat. Um, so we're going to do this for two hours, then we'll um, come back here, probably take a break, and then for the rest of the day, we'll be um, working individually on scripts. And to maintain some level of professionality was, was really challenging, but at the same time it was also so cathartic for me to be able to tell this story because it's been something that's been sitting inside of me ever since I joined the project a year and a half ago and it felt like it needed to be told and um, I just worked on the script and worked on the script and worked on the script and just kept tweaking it line by line by line and it never felt right and I was sitting with one of, the, uh, one of our other team members and I just made one change and I turned to her and said, can I just read it through to you one more time? And I read it and I just, like, I lost it. It's like, ah, oh. I just started weeping and I said, that's it, that's what it needs to be. I was thinking that it would be um, easier than it was and it turned out to be a challenge. Not only the, the technical part of it, but um, the narrative that I did was very difficult and having to keep watching that in order to to do the Wii video was very hard. Let's wait for the train. Oh yeah. Nope. <laughs> I was a wild child. Wilderness is where my roots went deepest. Put in like the rest of the story pictures or wait until like those pictures don't fit them right in. Yeah, but this picture's not in. This picture. Don't go to the rest of the picture. When you see that, you know, there's, you're not alone, there's a lot of people out there that are doing this, you know, there's a lot of encouragement within that. And I feel that I would like to learn this process so that I can pass it on to younger generations because they're really using this technology. I think that just to have images of, of him and even pictures just of you, like, we can do the work as we're watching it. But I'll take a lot back with me. And I think that when you can do that, as many conferences and trainings and seminars as I've been to, because I've worked half my life with Indian tribes, um, most of them you walk away from going, I don't know why I came to this. And I definitely know why I came to this one now. I opened the window shades and looked out to the corral. Where are they? I quickly dressed and grabbed a coat. The north fence of the corral was down. I looked toward the main gate on Ethity Road. Damn. It was open. I was getting ready to plant my garden. I had all my seed packs spread out on the kitchen table when my nephew came in. 
Auntie, can you grow cucumbers so you can make pickles for me, he asked. So I planted cucumbers, picklers, and regular ones. As the weeks came and went, he would check to see how big they had grown. He would go down the rows, counting the flowers, and letting me know how many cucumbers there were going to be. The story I kind of want to tell is how Wyoming itself has shaped what food is to me. Because of because of our gardens and the and the stuff that we collect and distribute through our shares program, I mean, hundreds of people are getting getting fresh produce that are originally would not have had access to it. Hunting to put food in your freezer is kind of like growing your own garden. In the end, whether you're packing 100 pounds of elk meat out of a canyon in the dark or picking lettuce until your back hurts and the sun has disappeared, you're not noticing the pain in your back because the rewards of harvesting your own food are what will fill your mind. I did not want my brother's life to um, transition out. Um, where he's just a statistic and that there's no, um, nothing that comes out of the fact that as a statistic he's actually just another um, example of how vital it is for us to fix the system because if it was choice he would be here today. I was part of a project to reduce childhood obesity. It was so clear this was only a symptom of a greater problem with our food system. When I visited Fred during this time, it all became very personal. He was rapidly gaining weight and had developed diabetes. He had tried to take care of himself. He had been growing veggies on his patio in Brooklyn before it was cool to be sustainable. But trying to live on disability after work-related injury made it impossible for him to eat well, no matter how many tomatoes he produced. It was really cathartic and um, so I'm, I'm really happy with where it was even though the process was, was rough. <laughs> Wilderness is where my roots went deepest. I didn't sleep with a teddy at night but instead slept with a wicker basket kangaroo, hugged her till her ears fell off. I woke up with scratches, but that's the price we paid for love. I remember one time uh, we went to a door and was delivering a bag to a lady and her kids. And they had got used to seeing us and like used to every Tuesday and Friday we'd bring them their bag to where the little kids would be waiting at the door on those days for us to bring them the fresh fruits and vegetables. And he'd be standing out there just happy and then we'd pull up and he'll run out to the truck and get the bag and take it back to his mother. I grew up in the Acorn Housing Projects in West Oakland, California. In this part of Oakland, there are no grocery stores, no produce stands, or fresh food. People are able to help each other out and grow their own food. Mm. Mm. That one foot in front of the other. Good. We'll get there.